Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Webinar Express, which is Turn Up the Volume, Amplify Culture and Make a Difference, with our guest speaker, Nigel Dove, which has been organised by CIM Northwest Group. If you're a university student attending today's webinar, you may want to sign up to the CIM Marketing Club. It'll keep you up to date with the latest trends, innovations and concepts in the marketing industry. All you need to do is hover your mobile phone camera lens over the QR code you can see on the screen at the moment, and it will take you to the Marketing Club sign up page. So I'd now like to hand you over to Nigel Dove, who is Director of Marketing and Communications at Jacobs, who is our guest speaker today. Over to you, Nigel. That's great. Thank you, Judith. And a good afternoon, good evening, or oh, good morning to wherever you're joining us from. I'm really pleased to be here and thank you for the CIM for the invitation uh, to come and talk to you. So I've got about 30 minutes and I've got a few slides and I'm going to run through them fairly quickly. Uh, and as you'll sort of seen from the culture and the introduction, what I want to share with you today, really, and this is this is me sharing a lot of my experience is the relationship between organizational culture and brand and we don't often talk about this uh, and this is very much practical uh, sharing of my experience uh, and I'll explain to you why I think it matters you'll sort of hear a little bit about why I'm passionate about this subject and I'll talk to you in the uh, in the auspices of my role uh, of Jacobs at the moment so just uh, a little bit about my background is I've been in marketing and comms roles for about 20 years, uh, fairly senior ones in a variety of public and private sector organizations. And I've learned a huge amount over, the, over that time. In my current role, I currently look after marketing and communications for Jacobs uh, within a business unit that is called uh, Energy Security and Technology. And we have about 7,000 people in our business. Uh, and, I, and that's about 13% of the whole Jacobs workforce, and I sit on our leadership team. So the context for this, you'll recognize the, hopefully the circle on the right, which is the Chartered Institute of Marketing Professional Standards. And the areas I'm gonna cover are customer experience, reputation, risk and compliance, and brand. And then of course, the, the, central, the central bullseye there about insights and championing the customer and strategy. And, and really I want to challenge you uh, today to think about what you, how you perceive your role in your organization. Uh, and I hope that'll be useful for you. I, I maybe want to get you to think about your role in a slightly different way. Uh, you may already be in this space, in which case it may just uh, reconfirm your thoughts on, on this subject, but I want to get you to think about how organizations are viewed by the different stakeholders and how those need to come together for us to deliver a consistent brand and experience. And I really blur the boundaries of what we think we we are as marketing and communications professionals. And then finally, what the senior managers look for in their in their communications team. So we all start each meeting that we have within Jacobs and usually externally within Jacobs with a culture of caring moment. And I'll I'll touch on this later on in my presentation. And this is one I wanted to share with you because I think it's relevant for you and your role in marketing communications. And this is called the uh, this is called the five levels of listening, and why does this why does this sort of why does this sort of matter? And and what is it saying? It's essentially saying that human beings tend to listen to respond. So if you or I are in a conversation uh, and you're talking, I'll be listening, and I'll be listening with an intent to respond. But of course, there are different reasons for listening. And and this uh, this chart, this little diagram, shows the five ways that you can actually listen so it's not just listening to respond but listening for emotion and listen for meaning and this was developed by a a hostage negotiator in the fbi and uh, when then when they're negotiating uh with uh in in stressful scenarios they have five people listening and they're listening for each of these five different uh, different aspects uh and i also really like the uh, atticus finch quote there on there to kill a mockingbird so Really, we are interested in listening, uh, and great communicators listen, uh, whether that's to customers or or to other audiences. So that's my culture of caring moment. How you found that useful? Okay, let's press on. A little bit about Jacobs. You probably won't have, have heard of Jacobs. Uh, we are a uh, a global company, and we are essentially involved in solving some of the world's most critical problems in the areas of built environment, infrastructure, energy, defence, cyber, and intelligence. Uh, and we're 55,000 people, we're in 40 countries. 
big company, uh, 13 billion pounds uh, revenue, roughly uh, dollars revenue. Uh, what do we do? Uh, here's a summary of our capabilities. So we are really very much in the uh, the space of providing project management, design, uh, and engineering uh, services to our clients. So we're a business to business organization, but you can see the, the sort of breadth of some of the things that we get involved with on the screen. You might not have heard of Jacobs the company, but you will have heard of our projects. So here's just an exa some examples on the screen. Uh, we were pr program managers for the London 2012 Olympics. We're doing the same job for Dubai Expo, an amazing project worth going to have a look at if you've not seen it on the bottom left. Uh, the top right image is Hinkley Point C, which is Europe's biggest construction project. And then the other, other pictures show the House of Commons, and we're leading the restoration of the House of Commons. In the US, we are NASA's biggest uh, service provider, so we run a lot of the, uh, of the launch centers. When you see things going up, we have people in those control centers. And another project in the Middle East we're involved with is the Qatar World Cup and bringing those facilities to bear. So some really high profile projects. And Jacobs has been on on a change curve, and this sort of just for context, really, this this chart summarises it qu quite well. Uh, and this essentially started when Jacobs appointed a new chief executive in uh, 2015, uh, a really interesting guy called Steve Dimitrio. And at that time, Jacobs was alongside uh, most other big engineering companies heavily dependent on the oil and gas uh, market, which is cyclical. Uh, so following a portfolio review. Uh, Jacob sold its oil and gas business uh, and acquired CH2M Hill, uh, another big business which was heavily into program management and infrastructure. Uh, and you can sort of see the share price uh, tracking up there as well. And then since then, it's pretty much transformed its portfolio. So uh, it bought a company in the US called QW, which is a major cyber company uh, in 2019. And I joined Jacobs in March, on 9th of March 2020, as part of the wood nuclear acquisition. Uh, and then our final, uh, our, well, one of our most recent uh, investments in the UK has been to buy a 65% stake in PA Consulting. So really sort of dramatic transformation in terms of the company and the, uh, the portfolio that we operate in. And what, what's the other interesting thing about that chart was the launch of the new brand. So you can see that the J mark in uh, 2019 and challenging today, reinventing tomorrow. So that was a, re uh, a relaunch of the Jacobs brand to align with the, the sort of new, new portfolio. And what's underlined all of this has been a transformation of Jacobs culture. Uh, and that's what I want to sort of share with you today. Now, my introduction to organizational culture was at university. And I have to say, I didn't quite understand it. And uh, there's a, a classic sort of book that's used to describe organizational culture by a guy called Charles Handy. Uh, and so I always remember studying this at university and thinking, I don't really quite understand what this is this is all about. And then when I went out into the world of work and I got my first sort of roles, I was still sort of struggling to understand really what, what does it actually mean. And what I've come to understand is that essentially, there's a there's a much more practical way to think about organisational culture, and and that's summarised in the in the green box. Uh, and I've only, I guess, I've only come to think about it in such a literal way since I've worked for Jacobs in the past two years, because it's quite often companies. All the companies I've worked for have been good companies, uh, and they've all had very solid values uh, and all been good places to work. But I wouldn't say they've been particularly distinctive. Uh, so could I sum those organizations up in three words? Not not easily. Could I easily describe what we stand for? Uh, could I touch and feel the culture? Probably not. Uh, and that, that's really really been quite quite interesting to me. Uh, the whole experience of of how of how that works and the benefits of that. And and I really like this chart that I'm showing now, which talks about the relationship between brand and culture. So as marketing people. We, we always we're at the top of that of that iceberg in terms of typically engaged with how we promote and develop our experience and our offerings. But the the bit below the waterline to me is the bit that as I've become more experienced, I've understood is really fundamental 
to how stable that brand offering is because it's the piece that anchors everything together. So what's below the waterline and what stops that experience and offering from tipping over? It's the culture of the organization. And by culture, we mean the combination of what we're here to do, the values that the business exhibits and the behaviors that people show day in, day out. And the best definition of values I've heard of is what, what we do when people aren't looking. Uh, and things aren't visible so it's just our our natural reaction to situations that we come across at work that that really does determine our our values so the building block for jacob's culture uh is on the slide here so you can see our values on the left hand side we do things right we challenge the accepted we aim high and we live inclusion those are good values they may be very similar to your values I'm not sure the unique values. I think what's unique is how we try and bring them to life uh, within Jacobs. And the two key diagrams on, on this slide uh, are, first of all, uh, our plan beyond strategy. So this is our sustainable business strategy. Uh, and that means basically how we think about long-term business resilience and success whilst we're positively contributing towards society and the environment. And we align those with the, uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and again, you may have similar uh, strategies and approaches within your business. And then the other fundamental building block of the Jacobs culture is together beyond. Uh, and that's our approach to living inclusion and creating a culture of belonging. And essentially, we're trying to create a place where everybody can bring their whole self to work. And there are four pillars to our, our uh, Together Beyond uh, strategy. One is about culture building and engagement. So we actively talk about it and actively try and find ways to, to build uh, the culture and demonstrate it. The second one, which is really important, is about leadership and accountability. So really clear uh, expectations of leaders to live our culture. The third one is around developing talent and how we develop talent in a really inclusive way. And then the fourth one is around growing our business because all of this helps us to grow our business because in order for us to generate the best solutions for some of those projects you saw earlier, we, we need a really inclusive approach so that everybody can bring their different ideas uh, to the party. And those really are the foundation, foundation aspects to, to our culture. So, I want to look at some quite practical things now in terms of, so we talk about a culture of caring in Jacobs, uh, and we talk about caring for our family, for our friends, for our colleagues. What does that look like? So I mentioned uh, earlier on in the presentation, I started with the culture of caring, and we do that literally for every meeting that we have, and we'll do that with external clients as well. Uh, and if you start every meeting with doing one particular thing, then it becomes it becomes a habit and it becomes an expectation. If you work for an engineering company or a construction company, typically you'll be doing that around physical safety. Uh, you might also be doing that around mental health safety. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute because that's a, a big part of, of what we do. And I suspect what your organizations do too. Uh, we just talk about caring. So I'll give you two great culture of caring examples that I've heard recently. The first one was a colleague who was a uh, Went outside uh, in his went outside from his house to to drive when he lives on an estate and the kids were playing outside in the estate and they were playing hide and seek and he set his, he set off in his car and he drove about two feet and then he realised he'd left his phone in the uh, in the house so he, he got out of his car and he opened the door and he heard this terrible noise from under the car and uh, he just didn't know what was going on he looked under the car and one of the neighbour's kids was under his car because they'd hidden there during hide and seek so. The, the the child was fine, a bit bumped and bruised. An amazing intervention of fate with his phone. Uh, he shared that with us. We shared that with our clients. So particularly when I, pretty much most people who work for Jacobs now, when they leave the house, they will call, they will they will have a quick look under the car. We don't expect to see kids there, but you can see uh, a neighbour's pet there. So that's that's a, that's an example of a culture of caring. Another one uh, we sh I heard shared yesterday was the impact of sleep on your physical health and how can you improve your sleep and we had a sort of a brief discussion around that so really getting those that idea of caring and really caring and get ingrained into the organization uh, 
bottom left is a picture of our uh, CEO virtual town hall. So when the COVID lockdown started, we ran town halls for 55,000 people led by the chief exec every week. And one of the first things he said in the sort of pretty much the first one we did was that no one would lose their job at Jacobs as a result of COVID. And we've held that line. Uh, so a really great example of leadership and caring. Uh, we spend a lot of time thanking people. So we have awards uh, as you do, but again, ingrained into how, how we lead and manage people. We talk a lot about positivity. Uh, and so we started an internal newsletter called Positive Energy, uh, just sharing all the great volunteering and community work that people were doing across the business. And we we, we started it in about the third week of lockdown and we, we thought we'll give it a go for every two weeks and we're still doing it sort of two years later. And then the final one there I just wanted to share is a, a campaign that we're developing called The Gift. And that's my colleague, uh, Marcus Williams, whose life was shared by stem cell transplant. So we have 55,000 people. So we are encouraging people to think about how they might engage in, in different forms of, uh, of donation to help save people's lives. So I mentioned mental health briefly. This is what our mental health and resiliency program uh, looks like at the moment. And the sort of snapshot on the, the left hand side are the resiliency webinars that we started running during lockdown and we're still running them. And again, we're running these and we've got maybe two and three thousand people joining live we record them so people can watch them back and we're looking at all sorts of different aspects of, of mental health and essentially we're trying to explain to people why they might be feeling what they're feeling so they can identify with things uh, and we have trained uh, people on those on the calls that help us so we're sort of not just uh, enthusiastic amateurs we've got professional people uh, helping us with with this content so explain why people might feel like they do, uh, what the signs are, and then what they can do about. And we've done sort of fairly obvious topics. And then if you were wondering what Cheesecake for the Mind is all about, that one was about the positive impact that music can have on your mental health. So we've done a lot of outreach work with our staff around mental health. We already had a good mental health network of champions, but we've really accelerated that during lockdown. And then on the right hand side, we've introduced a, an app called One Million Lives. So if you're interested in this, uh, you can download that for free and use it. And we employ a lot of engineers and uh, they like to measure things. So the idea with One Million Lives is it gives you a really quick way to measure how, how positive you're feeling about your mental health. And it gives you uh, a rating and then it gives you some suggestions for how you can, how you, things that you can do to improve your, your positive mental health. Uh, so we're doing more and more work on that. But again, it's another aspect of us demonstrating our caring culture. And then the, the final aspect, I guess, of caring is inclusion. Uh, and so on the left hand side, you'll see uh, something called our Jacobs Employee Networks. So these are employee led networks. They're global, but we have regional chapters, too, because we're a global company uh, for people who want to either identify or support people in those in those particular areas. So I'm a member of uh, the Women's Network because I'm passionate about in, in improving uh, the numbers of women we have in our business and in leadership roles. And also I'm a passionate uh, member of our Harambe Network, uh, which is our for, for our black uh, members of staff. But the, you don't have to be black to join. There are lots of uh, people like myself, white middle-aged, <laughs> who, who, who are on those networks because we are allies for all of those people. Uh, so, so what does inclusion look like in practice? It means taking a stand. So George Floyd was a big catalyst for us in this agenda. Uh, we have had a number of amazing, courageous conversations where, again, we've got a lot of people uh, who are sharing their experience, their lived experiences of what it's like to be a black person uh, in, in, in work sense, in life sense, and they are the most educational things I've ever done in my career. And uh, I'll, part the purpose of those is to educate people. Uh, and so people could just sit and listen and understand what it's like to walk in another person's shoes. We've rolled out Advocate and Ally uh, learning for all of our staff as well. That's the bottom right hand side. And then we also launched a, uh, a policy called the Advancement of Social Justice on, again, off the back of uh, 
George Floyd, which is what Jacob is going to do to proactively uh, push for social justice. So inclusion is a really big uh, focus on Jacobs. I won't pretend we are there yet with that fully, but we are on a on a rapidly accelerating journey, and it's brilliant, I have to say, to be part of it uh, as a sort of marketing communications and and as a leader, it's uh, it's completely inspiring. I just wanted to, if you are interested in this in this agenda, uh, and as you can tell, I'm sort of interested and and sort of passionate about it. There's a great uh, leader called Sint Marshall and we came across Sint because she's the first black female uh, chief, uh, chief exec of uh, an NBA basketball team and it happens to be in Dallas which is where Jacobs is headquartered so uh, we have made connection with Sint and she's come up with some great sort of uh, she's if you want to google her she's got great story about her background how she got to where she is and the role that she took on at Dallas Mavericks in a really challenging time and how she completely turned the organization around. And the reason I'm showing you Sint is because she's come up with a great quote, which I use all of the time, about diversity, inclusion, diversity, and they're, they're related, but they're not the same thing. So think about diversity being invited to the party. So we need to have a diverse workforce uh, as a start of a 10, but it's not inclusive unless we're able to bring those people uh, to the fore. And get them truly involved in the business. So inclusivity has been effectively asked to dance. And the the sort of final extension of that then is a sense of belonging and how we develop a sense of belonging for our people, uh, which they will then all of this radiates out to our clients, by the way. So the, the sort of the internal is the external now, and we've all seen this in many different sorts of aspects of marketing and communication. Uh, but definitely trying to build on that sense of belonging and encouraging people to feel like they can dance. So I want to talk a little bit about change as well because that's been a big aspect of what, I, why I've, what I've been involved with uh, through my career uh, in my role and essentially it doesn't matter whether we're talking about the sale or acquisition which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute which was my experience or any organizational change but it's basically about landing the why and the what. And the why is often more important than the what. So in my experience, if people can understand why you need change, then they're far more likely to embrace, understand and respond positively to it. Uh, you'd also need to land the what. So there's nothing that frustrates me more uh, than trying to communicate something that it's not clear what's changed. So uh, we need to be really clear when we're communicating change, what's different tomorrow compared to what it was like today. And the other, the other aspect of this is, again, it's an interesting leadership piece, which is if your leaders uh, are convinced about this themselves, then it will be conveyed. Uh, if your leaders are reading from a script and don't believe it, then you've got less likelihood of that landing, of that message landing positively. And then the final part I'd say about change is it's not a straight line. So we always like to think we're going to go from uh, we want to go to B, so we talk about right to left thinking often. So we, where do we want to get to, and then let's work backwards from where we are now and how we get there. Often the point B can change, so I call that the change ho hokey cokey, which we have to respond to. Uh, but again, if you can focus on the why, uh, then the what will generally follow. A couple of other thoughts around around change. Uh, use this a lot when we were doing our sort of business integration of two businesses so i helped to bring two businesses together so wood nuclear coming together into a long-standing jacobs business unit two and a half thousand people into two and a half thousand people we brought it together to five to five thousand people we're now seven now and pretty much what you've got to remember about change is it's a roller coaster and everybody's on a different place on this roller coaster and you may well be in the height of excitement, uh, trying to convince people of the change, uh, but they may well still be on point one in shock. So this is a, a good discussion. We use this as culture of caring moment often when we're doing change to recognize that people will feel differently uh, at different stages of the journey. Uh, and that's OK. And uh, it's OK to normalize this and talk about it. And we're all going through more and more change. And, you know, you could have we've seen things in lockdown in terms of following this sort of narrative as well. Uh, OK, so I've got about five, six minutes to go and I want to give you a very quick business 101 of things to consider 
if you are ever in a position where you get a phone call to say, uh, oh, by the way, it's likely we're going to be sold. Uh, we'd like you to lead the, uh, the communications on the process. So here are the things to consider. Uh, first of all, and if you've not been involved with this, you might, you'll, I'm sure you'll find this uh, useful. First of all, the phases, and you sort of typically see that's a typical running order of phases of announcements, but these can be concertinaed really closely. So the pre-announcement and public announcement can be one, and day one can be really short, uh, and integration and then normalization can, can be shorter too. But in, in our case, uh, we were working uh, behind the scenes before the public announcement was was made under strict uh under strict ndas uh and then we made the public announcement and then we worked towards day one which was when the the legal deal was completed then we uh we started the integration which is bringing the two businesses together and then you get to the stage where you're normalized uh and the the integration for our you know our business took us nine months uh which was reasonably uh racy but we delivered it in nine months to the point where after, after nine months, we're getting into sort of a, a normalization phase. Thinking about the audiences, you, you've got at least four audiences that you're needing to consider within all of this. You've got investors uh, and your shareholders uh, and your leaders will be fundamentally uh, involved and interested in, in, in their view. Uh, you've got staff, of course, uh, and then you've got clients and then you've got a, sort of a whole myriad of stakeholders. and but by the way, you can think these are all separate audiences, and they are, but your clients uh, and your staff will watch the investor call to see what to see what the chief executive says about the deal and the rationale for the deal. So all of this needs to be tied up together uh, in terms of the coherence of the messages. And then, of course, there's there's risks as well. So what are the risks of integrations? The, the risks are, are many, actually. Uh, it sounds simple to do, it's really not simple to do, and that's because we're dealing with human beings. Uh, so the risks are customers leave, staff leave, you might leave, uh, your boss might leave. And then to a certain extent, there's an interesting piece about some people will want everything to change and some people will, uh, will want nothing to change. Uh, and so you've got that whole thing about everything is different or nothing is different. So those are the things you've got to consider uh, when you're running the sort of marketing communications of this. Uh, so we started with the end in mind again in terms of when we were doing the integration. So what did we actually want people to feel when we brought the businesses together? Uh, and this was client staff. Uh, and we came up with sort of four four feelings that we want people we wanted people to uh, to get out of the deal. And that pretty much was our navigational point. So everything we did around integration was to deliver those those feelings. So often you've got the choice of do you do something expedient when you're integrating systems, for instance, or do you some do you do something that delivers a really great result for the staff? So by clearly setting this out on the right hand side, we uh, we were able to deliver a really great experience for our clients and our customers during integration. And we actually thought about well how are the cultures different between the two organisations? And we did a bit of a chart, and you see there's some differences, but you also see actually there's lots of similarities, but by thinking about that, you're sort of understanding how people are going to react. Uh, this is a brief uh, picture of our sort of change plan. Uh, so see day one there, the employees, customers, and we had media and investors on top of that, but I won't put it all on the chart. Uh, but just to look at really uh, how we're going to deliver that, that experience for people. And I'll just tell you one sort of side story people getting a new security pass uh, was deemed to be a really important thing when we talked to people because typically in an organization that might have been through change before, a lot of stuff just gets rebranded but nothing really changes. And the example of that was people who have passes with logos on from a couple of companies ago or the previous company. So just to get everybody a new security pass on day one when they arrived with all of the officers rebranded, you know, overnight was a big thing and it made it immediately feel different. Uh, so we knew that and we delivered it. And the journey continues really. So uh, Jacobs is is a really dynamic company and we're moving into new areas. So we're moving into new sectors, uh, continuing with our acquisition trail. So we made another one a couple, a couple of months ago uh, and that will continue. So 
it sort of never stands still. But I guess the, the one thing this also does is position people for change uh, and that sort of expectation that the company is going to going to continue to develop and push forwards. So this is my sort of final slide uh, and I'm not going to I'm not going to read it all. You can read that yourself. Uh, the fundamental lessons for me uh, to share with you is it's not what businesses say, but it's what businesses do that really matters. Uh, and I know that's a might be a blindingly obvious statement, but I think it's our role as marketeers and communications people to make sure that business, the business does deliver what it says, and we always try, we always, always aim to uh, over deliver and under promise. Uh, and and if you want your culture to feel uh, people to feel the culture, it's got to be authentic. Uh, and, and finally, uh, we are great creative problem solvers. And that is a unique trait for business leaders. It's our most valuable trait. So you can use that wisely and you choose where you where you deploy that. I'll give you one final example of what I mean by that. Recruiting people is our biggest challenge at the moment. Uh, we have a lot of work. Uh, we need to get more people to be able to deliver that work. So is that a job for marketing and communications? You might say no. It's a huge challenge for the business that needs some creative thinking around it. So I've deployed one of my best team members to the group to help to transform the way that we actually recruit uh, people into the business uh, because it's so important. That's all I wanted to share with you. Appreciate I've gone through uh, quite a lot quite quickly, uh, but I think we're going to go over to Judith for questions now, Judith. Brilliant, that's great. Thanks very much, Nigel, for a really insightful presentation. So we're now going to have a short, quick Q&A session. So the first question, what do you think comes first, brand values or organisational culture? Let me tell you the way that the Jacobs uh, brand was developed uh, and the J-Mark and the uh, Challenging Today and Reinvent, Reinventing Tomorrow. That, that was developed by an agency coming in and deeply understanding the existing organisation and how we work. And the brand came out of that. It wasn't a new startup where we create, you know, uh, an aspirational brand to the right hand side. It was absolutely based on the foundations of the business. OK, um, next question. Um, someone saying Jacobs clearly lives and breathes its brand values and they underpin its organisational culture. Do you think that brands now lack credibility if the brand values are just marketing spiel and not embedded in their culture? I'd say they have a, they have a limited lifespan. So when we talk about sustainability, in business, sometimes we mean environmental issues, but generally we mean how sustainable is what we are doing. Uh, is it, you know, is, is it a long-term path? So it's the iceberg model again. If you're, particularly if you're in a business-to-business -business organization uh, where relationships are everything, how you do things is as, is as important as what you do, then if you are, if you don't have brand and cultural alignment, uh, then you're essentially, you know, presenting a veneer, aren't you? Uh, and it's easy for me to say that as a senior leader, but all, what we're always trying to do is to uh, bring the brand to life. And it's a lot easier to bring the brand to life if the connection between the brand and the culture are pretty much, you know, indivisible. Okay. And then the next question is, um, do you have a top tip for getting colleagues to engage on social media to promote culture? That's a really, that's a great question. Uh, I think you need a certain amount of, of braveness. So it's easy if you take, if the company takes a stand uh, like Jacobs did around uh, around George Floyd, then people will get behind that uh, and people will be proud to share that. So if people are proud about what you're doing, they'll want to share it. Uh, so again, it comes back to sort of authenticity, I guess. You are, if you're doing interesting things, people that people align with, they'll want to share that, uh, and it's more natural, you know. Right. Um, we've got a few questions from somebody about um, sort of um, where there's a clash of cultures between the the, the values of um, Jacobs, perhaps, and perhaps certain international cultures where there could be sort of human rights issues involved. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a brilliant question. Cultures? Yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to take that one, Judith. So, yeah, okay. so you're right, and it's a really, it's a really good question. Uh, and there are, there are areas that we we don't operate in. Uh, 
and sometimes that's because of our uh, American ownership. And so, for instance, you know, uh, export restrictions with China is, is an obvious example. And there are areas that we operate in that where they do where there are different cultures to uh, different values to Jacobs, but they are they are changing. So we we will tell we generally take the approach of we would rather be in an area and help it to change and we do do that uh, than just ignore it entirely so we don't just go there for the commercial value but we'll always go there with a view to can we help that company that that place but you know in terms of on its journey of progression so the middle east is is, is a great example which is which is changing rapidly uh, and you get you have a different view of the middle east if you're not working there and if you're an outsider looking in uh, but definitely uh, our role is, you know, to go and try and shape and influence rather than rather than ignore. OK, um, next question. How do you ensure brand values and culture are replicated across all the offices? Are there any places where it's more of a struggle? Uh, no, you, you keep it simple. So the culture of caring is probably the best example I can give. You know, there is no definition particularly for what that means. Uh, people will you know, execute that differently in their different offices. And of course, different offices will always have, you know, different focuses, as long as they have that underlying culture of caring and inclusivity, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and that will be different in different nations because different nations are, you know, have different mixes of populations. Some are, are more diverse than others, but, but that's okay because as long as you've got the foundational bedrock of what, we, of what we're trying to achieve, uh, then, you know, that gets played differently in different in different places, and that's that's okay because again, it has to be authentic to the people. Okay. Um, next question: Should companies create or write a company's values and branding document to share when joining the company as part of an induction process? Perhaps does Jacobs have such a thing? Yeah, it it does. Uh, so uh, our brand and our values are the same thing, by the way. So uh, we have a really short intro about what's the purpose of of jacobs and we have a sort of a broader vision i've not mentioned it actually today but we have a broader vision about uh sustainable development and innovative solutions for, for a better world basically uh so that's our sort of high level purpose uh but we're quite clear about what the values are what the brand are what's more important is within the first week is people see that culture of caring and that inclusion being uh been delivered in different ways uh, and i always ask people when they join you know within a couple of weeks how are you finding it uh, and generally uh could just be the people i speak to but generally and our sort of survey stuff shows this is you know they 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 say wow i really sort of i read the stuff beforehand but i didn't know if it was going to be the case but i genuinely see it being being delivered uh which is which is brilliant you know OK, um, next question um, from someone who's saying, as a middle management employee focused on building operations and culture, but bridging the gap from the top management and with the overall staff, um, the misalignment can be very vast. What is your advice on that? Yeah, I always take the the view on this stuff is that I, I always, and it, we, we often talk about this when we think, when we're having inclusion discussions uh, you start with positive intent so generally in my experience and it doesn't matter whether it's a leader or it's a junior member of staff people want to do a good job and they start with positive intent so sort of take that on face value uh, you do need your leadership aligned but you also need your middle management aligned and i would say that's as important sometimes as your leadership uh, because leadership has a has a shadow that it casts, but it's it can be quite a a broad shadow, but it's it's not necessarily exposed that often. So most of your staff's relationships will be with your managers. Uh, your leaders absolutely need to be delivering the right values and behaviours. So it it has to be top up and bottom down. Uh, and sometimes the best way to to get that conversation going if you're struggling. Uh, is to understand what staff think. Uh, and if leaders are, I've not worked with many leaders that don't want to understand how, how staff think. And I've not worked with many leaders that don't want to improve staff's relationship with organizations. So sometimes you need to speak to speak with data. Uh, and in my 
uh, experience, data always gets, is always a starting point for change. Okay, and I think we've got time for one final question. I think earlier in the presentation you said about being able to describe um, a culture in three words. How would you describe Jacobs in three words? I would describe Jacobs as caring, uh, inclusive and dynamic, just because of the amount of change that we're, we're sort of going through. Okay, thank you. And on that note, uh, we'll say thank you very much, Nigel, with some really good questions there from our viewers. So sadly, that's all we have time for for our webinar today. I'd like to say thanks to Nigel for today's presentation and to the CIM Northwest Group for organising the event. We do hope you found it interesting and worthwhile. We will be back on the 18th of January with our next webinar, which will be Marketing with Purpose with Ben Irons. You'll find further details listed on the events page on the CIM website, where you'll also be able to register for the session. So on behalf of CIM, thank you once again, Nigel, for a really good presentation. And thank you to all that joined us. And we look forward to welcoming you again to our webinars next year. Take care, everybody. Goodbye.